one of those two things anyway. Um, oh, my mic's there at last, great. Um, when we left our two teams yesterday, I think it's fair to say they had lots of questions. Uh, and so they sent two roving reporters down into the exhibition hall to try and get some answers. Uh, they sought out some of the many authoritative experts down there. But as we all know, it's also pretty easy to get sidetracked down in the exhibition, isn't it? Hi, I'm Emma. Hi Emma, my name's Derek, this is Kate. Hi, nice to meet you. We've actually got a few questions because I'm actually with Legal and General for my auto enrolment um, pension scheme at work. First one being, what exactly do you do with the money when I put it in? Well, we invest your money for you, Derek, so we'll put it in some funds that invest in stocks and shares, all different types of investment to give you a broadly diversified return. So. Basically, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket when you invest in that type of fund. How do you choose what investment to put my money into? I mean, I've got no idea where you're putting my money into. Yeah, and that's why you choose someone like us who've got a team of asset managers. They spend all their day deciding what's the best place to invest pensioners' money. And so they'll be the ones who are actually making the decisions about do they put it into stocks and shares? Do they put it into bonds, into cash? All of these kind of fairly complicated investment terms, but they're the ones who are making those decisions on your behalf for that fund you're in. Hiya. Hiya. Nest. Yep. So you guys are the auto-enrolment people? We are the auto-enrolment people, yes. We are a government-backed occupational pension scheme set up specifically to help employers and members with automatic enrolment. Brilliant, so what exactly does that mean? How are you helping us, the average Joe member of the public? At Nest, everything we do, we try to make use plain English, everyday language that people would understand. But I've got a personal favourite, so commutation due to triviality. What does that mean? I have no idea, what does it mean? <laughs> it, means get, it means get your cash out of your pot. And that's what we do. And that's pretty simple, I understood that. What are the risks involved? Because when you say investment, I think of risks. Yeah, I mean, there are some risks. I mean, you'll certainly have seen that stocks and shares, the prices can go down as well as up. But you've got a long time to invest. You know, you're young. So what you'll find is that being able to invest over the long term, you can really cope with a few ups and downs along the way. And you've got to take some risk. Otherwise, you're not going to get a good level of growth. And you do need that for your pension. Brilliant. Thank you. One more thing. Um, so, would you be able to help me with this? Yes, let's take a look. Oh, yes, uh, that's a proper benefit statement from Legal and General. Another customer of ours, Kate. Brilliant. Right, well, maybe you should come over here and we can talk about that in a lot more detail. Brilliant. Thank you. Great stuff. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. Thank you very much, Kate. A great piece there. Uh, and and I hope you got answers to your questions. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it in terms of questions from the teams. We, we move on to the bit we've all been waiting for now, their solutions, their answers, their challenge to us. So for the pitch part of the session, I'm gonna hand over to Sarah Pennells, who's gonna chair the rest of this event. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed, Graham. Well, over the last couple of days, you've heard some of the thoughts that the teams have had, both about how to get some of the challenges around pension savings and quite horrifyingly for some of the team members how long they might live for. Um, there will be some voting in this session just so you know you're going to be voting on some of the team's ideas so I know you've had voting in the other sessions throughout the conference but if you're not familiar with how to vote just uh, take a moment to have a look at the conference app. Basically if you click on this, the schedule, click on the session you'll get a live poll which will come up. So in a moment after we've heard the presentations from the two teams, you'll be able to vote on the ideas and I'll go through that at the time. So now, basically without further ado, I think it's time to hear the two ideas. And the first team we're going to kick off with is Team Greg and their team coach, Greg McClymont. Thank you. Sarah, 
Uh, this process began uh, with the, the idea that myself and Steve would coach our teams. As it proceeded, it became clear that the coaching was rather in reverse because what happened over the course of two and a half days was that certainly I learned so much about the way in which younger generations think and don't think about pensions and savings and the kind of ideas which we often talk about but don't necessarily have such a strong sense of the urgency with which they're felt by younger generations and these generations and together. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with both teams over the last couple of days. I've learned a lot and I want to thank uh, my team for, uh, for the great time we've had. But of course the most important part is to get to the ideas. And we threw and talked about a number of excellent ideas, but we had to narrow it down to three of course. So let's get cracking. Idea one, going to Kate first. Kate, we talked a lot about pensions. When I say the word pensions to you, what do you think? If we're honest, the, we, first of all, we thought it, it was quite negative things, to be honest. It was, um, I think, old. I think old age pensioners. Um, it's very outdated. Um, so they weren't very positive things. The language that we used is just, it's, it's not showing it in a very positive light, to be honest. Um, so we would like, or we would like to propose, to bring it to the uh, 21st century and change the language. Um, because saving in, to your pension is not just an age-specific thing. You need to start as early as you can, basically. Well, that's what we've learned. <laughs> um, and to change the way in which we think about it, I think, would be a positive thing. It feels it's about older people. It yes. doesn't connect with your generation. But that's it makes you think of old, old age, which you don't necessarily want to think about. Is that right? Yeah, but that's not how it should yeah. be, obviously. Yeah. So by maybe changing the terminology and making it into perhaps um, lifetime savings yeah. makes it more reachable for yeah. everyone at every age. Um, you know, if you think about in Australia, they call it my super, and that's very positive. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, if we could rebrand the future savings, that's, that's the way forward. Thank you, Kate. So idea one is to scrap the word pensions and move entirely to talking about lifetime savings, something which this conference, of course, uh, should be very familiar with. I think this morning the, the legal change went through. We no longer have the NEPF in legal terms, uh, as well as branding terms. But the big challenge is, it's easy to say, OK, well, let's get rid of the word pensions and talk about lifetime savings comprehensively and universally. But how do we do it? Darren, you've got some, some real strong ideas about how we embed that terminology into our future discussions. Definitely, and um, over the last few days we have serious discussions and we really feel that lifetime savings should be something that is taken into the schools and made part of the educational curriculum. I think it's important that we get young people talking about saving and, and making saving cool and, and fun. And I feel taking it into schools is the best way to start. And what in particular, Darren, about embedding it in the curriculum do you think is powerful? We spoke about, and I thought it was really interesting, the way you, you talked about peer pressure. And if, we, if, if kids in school can get talking that language, then the competitive element comes in. Definitely. That they, people want to outdo each other and they, they want to do better and have more savings than their, their Definitely peers. Definitely feel the, the power of peer pressure can come into play. A lot of kids might be in school and not necessarily taking what a teacher is saying, but if you go out into the playground and their, their peers are talking about it, it makes it a bit more, well, if my peers are doing it, I'd like to do it as well, topic of conversation, um, to progress. So scrap pensions, banish the word to history, talk comprehensively and consistently about lifetime savings, and to embed that for the long term, teach it in the national curriculum from an early age and use that competition which exists between kids as it does uh, amongst adults to make savings, lifetime savings cool. Now we think that will take us some way down the road of, of building a savings culture but I think in our discussions we weren't starry eyed about the nature of the challenges and such a process as that will take some time. It's a long term idea. What do we do with the, the savings crisis which was brought home to both teams um, when they, they inputted their own projected pensions income? 
in retirement and we're shocked at the shortfall. What can we do? What do we need to do right now to drive up savings? Colette, you've got some very strong views and this is our second idea about making lifetime savings compulsory. Colette. I think it's really important to have pensions or lifetime savings fund compulsory as soon as we start work because every month from our salary we have national insurance deducted, tax deducted and as much as everybody moans about it, it's the norm, we get on with it, we accept it and most of the time we don't even think about it. So if we have compulsory pension or lifetime savings fund taken out every month, people will moan at first but we'll get used to it, it will become the norm. And when we do finally retire, everyone will be happy and think, I'm so glad that it was compulsory. And is that because basically we have to be, if you pardon the pun, saved from ourselves? We do, because in my last job, it wasn't a compulsory pension. My boss said, we have to sort it out ourselves. So I just thought, OK, well, I'm not going to do it because I need the money right now. But now I'm like, OK, that's four years with no pension, no savings. So if I would have had the compulsory option, well, not even an option, if it was compulsory, then I would have had four years of savings that I haven't got now. It might mean a few less nights out. Well, exactly, but you know, you have to compromise, don't you? You've got to think of the future, so. So that's our second big idea, is to make lifetime savings compulsory with a minimum contribution rate between employer and employee of 10%. That's our second big idea. To deal with the crisis now, while in the long term, try to embed that, that new view of lifetime savings and banish the word pensions. Our third big idea, which speaks, I think, to something everyone in this room will be very aware of, is the challenge when you want to do the right thing but find obstacles in your way. Emily, you had a recent experience of trying to do the right thing when you move jobs and consolidate your pension pots. Can you tell us your story of the challenges you faced? I did, yeah. I had a small pension pot which I wanted to consolidate with my new jobs pension. Um, and it took me approximately five months to be able to do that, being passed from pillar to post. No one wanted to assist or said they were able to assist. I was told I needed to seek financial advice, but I wasn't told where to go for that. I was then told I needed to seek authorisation from um, somewhere else, but no one could tell me where. It was very hard work. To it was horrendous, wasn't it? And you must, did you feel like giving up? I did, yeah. I did wonder whether it was worth it, but I persisted and I did manage to do it in the end, but it took a while. And how many phone calls and letters and forms did you have to sign? Far too many. I was constantly chasing on the phone, um, emailing, had to fill in countless forms. It was a very hard process. If people want to do the right thing, young people want to do the right thing. How do we l lower those hurdles, remove those obstacles? Mike has, I think, a very powerful idea about how we do that. Mike, give us the pitch. Simple. Tap and go. <laughs> Tap and go. That's our third big idea. Mike, explain. So it's a simple app service where you have all your pension pots in a dashboard and it's going to be very easy for functionality to move one pot to the other. Um, as you can see, everyone has a smartphone. Everyone uses all the social media aspects. For example, what Facebook has over 1 billion users. My vision is to get everyone on a tap and go system so it's a lot more accessible and easier and I don't have pages and pages of forms of working out where my money's going and everything. It's just really simple. And it's not just a question of being able to see pension pots on the tap and go app, is it Mike? It's also about the ability to frictionlessly consolidate your pension pots. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. It, like, like I said, just bringing everything into one system it's a simple log-on service. You can use your iPad, your, your tablets, and it's just the ease of use. I mean, I've used internet banking for the last few years, and I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And that's changed the way that you look at your savings accounts, hasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. My thought process at the start of each month, um, I have my set wage. I'll put 10% in each current account, and I'll just leave it. And then I, think, I feel like, you know, I'm doing something towards my future. So I want to do the same with the pension pot. And you guys spend a lot of time online, as I understand it. A little too much. I don't know how much I do. Maybe 15 hours sometimes. Um, we are tax savvy, you know. Um, I know all you guys from London as well. You're on the tubes and stuff. And you're all espresso up doing all these app things. I just want to make it all simple. I just want to make it easy. <laughs> so that's it. Our three big ideas to encourage greater saving. First, let's 
banish the word pensions for the future. It doesn't resonate with younger generations. We need something better. Lifetime savings provides that better framework, a language which resonates. But second, given the challenge right now, compulsory lifetime savings. Thirdly, and it's really striking, my team had never heard of the word pensions dashboard when we began. And actually, we didn't use that language in our discussions. But it's such a powerful idea generated by my team without reference to what we know is going on in the broader policy framework that it makes that case for the way that younger people live their lives today. Be able to see your pots in one place and more importantly, be able to consolidate them without hassle, a waste of time and too heavy cost. So I want to say thank you very much to Team Greg. It's been an absolute pleasure and it's over to Team Steve. Thank you very much. Well done, guys. That was brilliant. Well done. So you've seen what uh, Team Greg, or you've heard what Team Greg how proposing, so now, now it is time to hear from Steve Webb's team, so over to Team Steve. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, um, as you can see, I've had a fantastic team. Uh, they came in a bit sceptical, wondering what they'd let themselves in for. They've taken three days of annual leave to do this, and um, they've all become pensions geeks. Uh, and actually, I, I, I looked over one of their shoulders earlier this morning, they were on Amazon, and on their Christmas wish list, it was lifetime membership of the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association. <laughs> so that's what this has done for them. Um, so in a minute, we're going to give you the pitch, the three brilliant ideas they've come up with. This is all their own work. I uh, came with several in my back pocket. Uh, I tried to smuggle a few in while they weren't looking, and they weren't having it. Uh, so this is genuinely all their own work. But just before we hear the pitch, uh, let me just ask the guys behind here. Mahmoud, you came here... What struck you? What surprised you? What's the biggest thing that you've been surprised by? Yeah, I've actually learned that as humans, we are living longer, and I've learned I'll be spending more time in my retirement as well. And is that, is that good news, or does that worry you a bit? Uh, it, it worries me a bit, but on the other hand, I spend more time in retirement so I can enjoy my free time. Excellent. Well, we're going to make sure you've got a big pension pot to enjoy your retirement with. So, you. um, and Derek, we saw you giving legal and general a hard time, so good on you. Um, now, <laughs> tell me a bit... Tell me a bit about uh, what you've picked up this week. What do you know now? What are you going to go away and do differently? Thanks, Steve. Um, the main thing I've picked up, and I think it's the same to all the team, is big shock. I don't know nothing about pension. So I've picked up that I don't know nothing about pension. <laughs> so it's, it's basically um, what I thought about pension was very, very watered down, and it's just a word at the back of my head, mm -hmm. and it's all taken care of and everything. But I've come here, I've met great people, great freebies, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> love the Aberdeen little cocktail bar. No, 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 no. <laughs> You've just gone very off message then. Well, never mind. Well, um, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Lovely. Um, if you pass the mic on to Lauren. So, the first pitch then, Lauren. How are we going to get people, particularly this generation, saving more? Lauren, what's our big idea? So our first, first theory is points makes pensions. So we looked at the gap in the market for young people saving and we wanted to aim uh, towards them using a, um, a method that they would use. So we looked at technology using an app um, and also a point system. So all the loyalty cards that you currently have, your Tesco club card, your Nectar card, instead of generating vouchers or days out, you can use it. Um, you scan all your cards into the app. You, ge you generate maybe £10 per card as an incentive to start. Um, and then once you build up your points, you can then put that into your pension instead of getting these vouchers or days out. Look at the long term. Yeah. Brilliant. Now tell me about your grandparents. Um, so my mum and dad, when I was at uni, and my grandparents um, used to all sign up to the same Tesco club card for me, so they used to give me all their vouchers. So we thought, because they've got their mortgages and their pensions already, they could all um, connect to the one account and put their points in to, to generate our pensions for us. Brilliant. So we're sorting out intergenerational equity at the same time here. Okay. <laughs> now, you mentioned something called a push yeah. notification. Now, just... just for the people who are older than me in the audience, what's a push notification? So a push notification is something that um, we feel would encourage um, younger people to take note of what is in their account. Um, so a gaming system we was going to use, um, a lot of people are into gaming, um, so it'll push them to see 
if they're near the next level, how much is in their savings pot, um, show them incentives that are given for them for their birthdays, maybe a little incentive from the government. Um, yeah, just to keep pushing them to save more. Fantastic. And we thought the amounts of money people get in Tesco vouchers and Nectar, and if you add all those things together, it's kind of a worthwhile sum of money. I mean, how yeah. much in a, in a month might people be talking about, do you think? Any idea? Just from Tesco alone, I mean, we can get up to 50 to £60. Pound. Um, so if you think about it, it could, it could be in the region of maybe £200 pounds per per person. And instead of spending it on uh, you know, yeah. days out. You can... Think of your long term. Think there of your you long term go. savings. So there you go. So that's points make pensions. Points what do points make? Pensions. pensions. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. <laughs> Worth a try. But no mind. That's brilliant, Lauren. Thank you very much. Okay. So Meg, over to you. We've got a second brilliant idea. And this came from the message that all these guys said to me after they'd uh, been here a few hours, you know, which was, why didn't anybody tell us? So Meg, what's our solution? Our second idea was plain English education are three key milestones in your life, which are when you leave education, when you become a new employee, or when you start a new family. We believe you need to be educated and taught basically what is a pension, how does it work, how much do you need to invest for the future to have a good quality of life, because we are not taught that. We are educated in financial terminology because there's a stigma with the word pension. You, you mentioned the word pension to our era and we put a barrier up. It's just jargon. We need to be taught no jargon, layman terms, basic understanding. So we feel confident to invest in our future and how much we need to invest and at what age. Brilliant. And you mentioned about these key stages. We're not trying to tell 17 year olds everything they'll ever need to know, but relevant mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, relevant, like, obviously, when you first leave education, we've, we've learned that you're not so volatile, so you can invest a lot, and you've got, you can take, like, a higher risk. We only learned that over the last couple of days. It was news to us. And then, like, as you get... Your life changes, so should your pension at key stages in your life. We just thought the word pension, and we thought it meant old. That's brilliant. And then you went around the exhibition, and I sat you in front of... Um asset managers and various other people, and there seemed to be a correlation between asset managers and champagne. I can't quite work that one out. But, um, and so what was your impression from going around the exhibition? Did you enjoy it? What worked for you from the things you saw that would have really helped you understand pensions? Well, we met a lovely guy, Investatech, I think, and he, under he explained to me in layman terms, no jargon, no financial terminology, percentages, basically volatility and how I could invest. And... I understand now I can go and invest. And we went around, we spoke to loads of people. And they were all so nice, but we didn't understand there were so many aspects to a pension. Administrators, investors, lawyers. We didn't understand that. We just thought the word pension was one part. That's right. So you've learned a lot. And you kind of think that if when we were leaving school, we learned things. If when we started a job, we learned things. And, and tell us about the point you're coming back off maternity leave very shortly. So, so when you go back to work, what would you like to, to hear from your firm or about pensions? Well, obviously, your life changes. You've got to invest in your bubble, and my bubble is my family. And I've just come back off maternity after having a baby, so when I go back, I want to invest for their future. And so, like, my, my family mind frame has changed from before I had the baby to now, mm. and I feel I need to invest a lot more, but I didn't realise the severity, how young I need to invest for their future, not just my own. And if I want a good quality of life, we, we were taught how much you really need to put in the pot and not rely on the state. Brilliant. And it's all about education, 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 because there's a lack of, there's a barrier between us and pensions. There's no in between. And we believe it should be taught in curricula like yourselves, but also the government needs to step in. Great. So that's our second pitch then, is three bits to it, plain English, education, at key stages in your life. So, finally, our third pitch. Um, now, we thought about forcing people to uh, save for their pension, but we've come up with something that's a bit closer to what we do now. But, Lloyd, tell us what's our third pitch. Um, we, we felt that comp compulsory, like Greg's team, might be a little bit harsh. Um, we, we had the option of, like now, an auto-enrolment into a pension. But just as you can auto-enrol now, you can opt out straight away. Um, and I think it's a case of changing people's mind frames and the way that they think. So if we had an opt-out option after six months, 
that will then encourage people to stay in it a lot longer and, and kind of get used to the money coming out of their account and thinking nothing about it. We, we compared it pretty much to a gym membership. So many people who get a gym membership in January, by February will fall off because the idea is great, but they're really not that committed to it. After the third or fourth month within the gym, you can see the changes within your body, within your physique, and the benefits of that. And I think that the comparison to pensions is exactly the same. You'll notice the pot is getting bigger. Um, and then we mentioned within that time frame of six months that education, again, is key. Um, you know, it's down to whether the pension providers, the employers, really, you know, infiltrating the information into the member uh, and letting them know what they're saving, how this is going to benefit them in the future. Um, sort of, we thought that maybe after the six-month period as well, just to keep people going even longer, perhaps a bonus from the government, you know, £50 maybe, or if you top your pension up by £100, we'll put another £50 into it. Uh, but it's just about changing the mind frame of people and the way that they're thinking and looking at pensions in a positive light rather than thinking of it as tax because, you know, it, it's not tax, it's helping you in the future. Brilliant. Um, I don't know why I was nodding when you were talking about gym membership. I, I think I've got a different pot of filling up. But um, So if you think about that six-month period, there's a bit of stick there. You know, you've got to stay in for six months but then there's a bit of carrot, so during that six-month period, we're talking about explaining stuff, and at the end, an incentive, is that a kind of idea? Yeah, absolutely. So you're probably going to have people that are going to moan after month one or month two, you know, I could do with that 60, 70 pounds in my account. But, you know, when it gets to month four, your employer can sit you down and say, you know, you have this in your pot at the moment. Did you really miss that money? The likelihood is people are going to say, well, actually, I'm kind of used to it now, so I may as well just top that up or stick with what I'm putting in at the moment. Brilliant. So even with the success of auto-enrolment, we've still got 10% opting out, possibly a bit more. That's a million people. And Lloyd's idea is we keep them in for six months, and then they're free to opt out, but we work on them in that six months. We're going to be incentive to stay in, and we can get even more people in pensions. Yeah? yeah, correct. So there we go, guys. There's our three ideas. We've got points make pensions. We've got plain English education for key points in your life. And we've got the idea of staying in for six months, working on people, encouraging them and rewarding so that even more people stay in pensions. So options, I assume, four, five and six, you choose between those. Thank you. <laughs> I think a big round of applause there for well done, Team guys. Steve. Very good. Very good. Well done. Now, as I mentioned, you will be able to vote on which idea is your favourite. But before, before we do that, maybe to help you, hopefully to help you make up your minds, I'm just going to try and sort of delve into these ideas in a little bit more detail so we can just see why the teams came up with the ideas they did and maybe about some ideas they also dismissed. So um, first question actually is to, to Team Steve. And you mentioned this idea of not being able to opt out of your pension for six months and, and you've explained Lloyd you're saying that you looked at the idea of making people save but dismiss that just tell me was that something you discussed a lot the idea of compulsory pension saving or did you dismiss that quite early on feeling it would be off-putting um, I, oh, um, I think that we we really the word compulsory we don't like tax is compulsory we don't want it to be a chore you know um, I think but to be honest with you, we did touch upon it and we realised immediately it was the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, we want people to look at pensions in such a positive light. Uh, and I think that giving them a time period to change their trail of thought, because I think that is important for, for realisation purposes. Uh, and I think that will work in the long run. And you, you, you've settled on six months yes. that people couldn't opt out in the first six months. I mean, did you feel that was long enough for people to think, well, actually, I am building up the money? Or was it more that you thought it was long enough for them to not miss the money that was going into their pension? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's long enough sort of not to, 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 to really notice the money coming out of your account. Um, you know, you just kind of get used to it. Um, it it's, it's just one of those things. It, it's just simply changing people's thought processes. That's what it falls down to, um, and realising that pensions are a good thing. Uh, and within that time frame period, just ensuring that people are educated why you're contributing, you know, you didn't miss the money, why not? You know, because it's such a little amount, really, of, of what you're spending. OK, just going to flip that slightly and take it to <clears throat> Team Greg. So one of your three ideas is to make people save compulsory. Um, so you said um, that people don't like paying tax on national insurance, but basically they kind of grumble and kind of get on with it. Just tell me a bit about the discussions that you had before you felt that actually making people save was a, a key idea? Well, I like to think it better than making people save. And maybe we could think of a better word than compulsory, because compulsory has got a negative 
kind of thing around it. But I know this generation is all about now, now, now. And I know that after six months, I'm like, oh, I've got a holiday coming up. I need that minute. Oh, it's Christmas. I'm going to opt out. I just know I would. And I know a lot of my friends would. And I've done it before. So I just think that it should be compulsory, but in a different word. OK. And um, the idea of the plain English education sort of that triggered for Team Steve, that sort of triggered at different life points, how, how do you think you get people who really don't want to hear it? You know, it's just may, maybe like you when you kind of came into this challenge of feeling like this is something that's years away. How do you think you pitch it or how would you really encourage to make sure it got through to the right people? I think you need to start at a younger age through like primary schools, doing like workshops, uh, case studies, um, bringing in like groups of people. Because I know myself as a working mum and I go to nursery groups and we talk about mm. the future of our children. And I think you need to plant the seeds at a very young age because in our era, my granddad has a really good like salary pension, which we only just learned about, and then my dad had nothing, it was abolished. And now it's our era, and we've missed that gap. There's a big gap and a lack of communication and a lack of information and education on pensions. The word pension frightens people. And did you talk about where that education should come from? I said, should it come from your employer or would, does it not matter who it comes from as long as the language was right? No, I think it needs to be part and part the government and the investment. It needs to come from both sides. The pension team needs to work alongside the government and it needs to be made mandatory to go through schools, further education, employees. It needs to be an all-round agreed. When you were talking, and this is for both teams really, but when you were talking about the idea of getting more people to save and either compulsory saving or, or not letting people opt out for six months, did you talk about people who were self-employed and about how you'd get them to save? Or was it more through the workplace? We didn't really touch on the self-employed, I think, because we've all come from an employment background. Anybody else want to chip in? Yeah. Yeah, we, we talked about self-employed because my boyfriend's self-employed and it should be, even if you're self-employed, that should be compulsory as well because, you know, everybody pays their taxes, self-employed people do as well. They should also have to do it compulsory as well. And we said it could just be like a minimum of 10%. It doesn't have to be a big amount. It doesn't, you know, it, it can be, there's no maximum, but a minimum of 10% for everybody. Okay. And the idea, I, the idea of um, points uh, make pensions... Um, I, I know there are a couple of apps at the moment that will encourage you to exercise. They'll convert points. You know, uh, if you exercise, they'll convert those into kind of reward points. How easy do you think it would be to get the supermarkets on board? Because they love loyalty schemes, because obviously it gets people to spend the money in their shops yeah. often. So do you think it would be easy or, or to get them on board, to get them excited by the idea of their points being used for pensions? Yeah, I think if, um, like Meg was saying, education, if so, if the supermarkets, um, shops were all educated about pensions and how that would, they, people would still use their vouchers, people would still spend in their supermarkets regardless. Um, but if, if they were educated and to see that it was benefit, benefiting um, everyone else, then I'm sure they would get on board. They, there, there, there would be big, massive supermarkets, uh, big companies, so, yeah. OK, just a couple more questions before it's time for the vote. And this is uh, Team Greg. Getting rid of the word pension, that was really, really important for you, wasn't it? Um, tell me a bit about, a bit more about... I mean, was that, was that one of your first ideas? Why did you feel so strongly that the language and getting the language right is, is crucial? I think because at the moment it just it really segregates people. We feel so far removed from the world of pensions because of this jargon that's used. We need to make it, bring it into the 21st century and actually make it usable for us um, because it is, it is a scary word. You know, you just don't, you don't relate it to yourselves and to your current life. Um, so as soon as we sort of rebrand that and bring it to the here and now, I think more people will be involved and more people want to start saving. I can almost hear a few pension companies thinking, oh, how do we, how do we rebrand now? But there we go. Um, and uh, would there, did you get as far as discussing what the money would be invested in if people were made, and I'm going to use the word compulsory, which I know you don't like, but basically, if you had, a, had a, an idea where people had to save in, into pension, did you get as far as talking about 
whether there should be kind of one scheme for them to put their money in or some hand-holding, or was it more just getting people to put money in whatever, it, whatever pension it was? We had a very interesting discussion, actually, about ethical investing ah, okay. and, and whether it would, how big a difference it would make um, to engagement and interest in uh, lifetime savings if millennials and uh, younger generations were more aware of actually what their funds were being invested in. We had some very interesting mm -hmm. views on that, didn't we? Yeah. I think in particular, the, the issue of climate change was seen as, a, as very important. And if, I'm, if, if I uh, can say there was a bit, I think it's fair to say, a gender divide yeah. on our group about the importance <laughs> of ethical investing, uh, the, the female members of the group felt more strongly in our discussions than the men and that it, it drifted out of our top three for for that reason but it was very it was a very interesting discussion well in my other life my, my that's something i definitely notice as well that there is quite a gender divide steve i think you want yeah. to just come in i was struck yes. by the guys as they went around the exhibition talking about how much they felt they didn't know i think felt wouldn't be confident trying to make detailed decisions about how the money was invested and i'm pleased that there are people who are good at that kind of thing but we focused on how you get as much money into the pot. And I think if you think of the money the government spends on, you know, a help to save scheme or a lifetime ice or whatever it is, governments do spend hundreds of millions of pounds incentivizing saving in very old fashioned ways. And what we like about the app is, you know, you could get a, a push notification, as I gather they're called, at the end of the <laughs> month that said, you know, you've nearly reached a thousand quid. If you put 10 quid in, we'll put 10 quid. You know, it's, it's a new way of thinking about government incentives, not the old fashioned way. Brilliant. Well, um, it's now the moment we've all been waiting, well, I've certainly been waiting for it, which is, which is the vote. <laughs> so if you don't mind going to your app, um, we've got the six choices which have helpfully disappeared from the screen. So I'll just read them out for you. If you just click on, oh, we already get the vote. Fantastic. Right. So option one, ditch pensions, rebrand it. Two, compulsory lifetime saving. Three, tap and go digital app. Four, and those are all from, uh, those are all from team Greg, and uh, uh, option four, points make pensions. Option five, plain English education. Option six, no opt out for six months. So a clear win there for option two, compulsory lifetime saving. So <laughs> fantastic. So a big, big round of applause. Big round of applause there for Team Greg that came up with the uh, move, the, the plan of compulsory lifetime saving. Now, of course, it's all very well having this fantastic challenge with these brilliant team members talking about what they'd like to see that would get them and people like them saving more. But it can only really make a difference if we do something about it. So I'd now like to welcome back on stage Chief Executive Joanne Seegers so we can just have a bit of a chat about what the PLSA is going to do with this information. Well, well... <coughs> I've lost Your speech is all about compulsory well, pension saving. Absolutely. Well, well, thanks, Sarah, for, for that session. And thanks to Greg, thanks to Steve, and thanks, most importantly, to all our uh, challengers. Um, I think you know, each of you have said that you've learned an awful lot uh, over the last couple of days. But I think, uh, you know, it's a sort of trite thing to say, but I think we've learned an awful lot from you, just hearing from you about you know, what are the issues, what are the pressures that you're all facing. Um, so thank you for participating and thank you for doing that with such enthusiasm and uh, such professionalism too. It's been great working with you. Um, and I think I can grant one of your Christmas wishes early. I think you've all well deserved membership, of li lifetime membership of the Pensions of the Lifetime Service. <laughs> Although somebody did say to me, you might have to go through another rebrand. Yes. Um, and after I picked myself up off the floor at the thought of the pensions bit falling off uh, our logo, as someone just said to me, um, you're all very, very welcome to lifetime membership of the PLSA. Um, and I think we've heard some really fantastic ideas. And I think, you know, they've all got huge, huge merit. And I think the challenge that we've now got is what do we do with them? Because, you know, we could sort of all go, I think, well, yeah, that was kind of interesting. And, and you know, that was sort of interesting academic exercise. We've heard some interesting stuff and off we go and we kind of get on with our day jobs and we forget all about it. But actually, I think that will be completely wrong. I think it's, right, it's up to us now LSA or LSA as we might end up being called, um, but all of us now to think about what is it that we really do with that. And so I think the challenge that we've got coming out of the pensions challenge is to act on the ideas. And I think actually we need to act on 
all of those ideas, because there are some really, really fantastic ideas in there. I especially like the app ones. I love the points make uh, pensions. Uh, I love the idea of, you know, just that ease of being able to switch your pension. It's one of the things that I know that I've got to do, and I keep thinking, yeah, I'll get around to that eventually, but I kind of know it's going to still take some, some time to do, and I probably know more than quite a lot of people about pensions, but I sort of slightly put off by the whole process. The idea of how do we get more money going into pensions in the first place, and how do we really sort of get that inertia, and really build that inertia and just get people used to saving in a pension? You know, as I'm all slightly older than you, um, you know, when I started work, I was automatically put into a pension scheme, and it was a case of I'd never, never missed the money, so, you know, it, what I never saw, I never missed. So, you know, I think there's an awful lot in, in that. And um, compulsory lifetime savings, too, which I thought was quite a surprising um, conclusion from this audience. It wasn't the one that I had my private bet would be the, <laughs> would be the winning answer. So I think there's a lot there, and I think it's up to us, really, to... Uh, think about it. And what I'd like to do is to come back to next year's conference with some of these ideas worked up and worked through. And I think it'd be great to get you guys back next year to come back and just tell us. Partly, you keep, us, you, you keep our feet to the floor about how well we've done in meeting your challenge. But actually, for us to kind of hear back from you a year on what you've done. Great. Well, we'll definitely hold you to that. I think that's a brilliant idea. So at the PLSA conference, this time next year, we'll be finding out what progress has been made, what's happened with these ideas. Um, I, I would just really like to thank everyone who's taken part in this, this challenge because they have done a fantastic job. So I think another round of applause for Team Greg and Team Steve. I think, I mean, not only do you have the joy of the lifetime membership of the Pension and Lifetime what Association, but probably you'll find you get offered a job in the pensions industry, which may fill you with horror, I don't know. But anyway, um, I'd also like to thank uh, the team coaches, Greg McClymont and Steve Webb, and to thank you as well for voting. I, and it's now time for you to have a quick coffee break, but thank you very much for your time. <laughs>